The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode 66. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Maybe so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. And joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? Very well, thanks. And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. So I, I didn't know Spock was missing, but uh, if anybody of you have seen him, well, please let know us know. We know this isn't Spaceballs Two: The Search for More Money. So yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Spock is always in the last place you look. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, folks, please, uh, before we get started, I want to uh, give our uh, my, my plea to you to please share the podcast with your friends uh, and help us grow the community of listeners. Uh, we, the only way we have, I've, as I always say, the only way we have to get the podcast out to more Trekkies is if the current Trekkies who listen, share it with them. So please uh, do that. And we really do appreciate that you do do that. We hear from people all the time. That uh, that was recommended by a friend, and uh, I, I really do appreciate that. So we are talking about Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. We recently talked about the Wrath of Khan, and uh, this movie came out in 1984, uh, a couple years after Wrath of Khan. It was uh, written by Harv Bennett, who wrote some of the better Star Trek movies. Right? Mm -hmm. Are we in agreement? But not Nicholas Meyer, who was the real creative force behind the best Star Trek movies. That's right. That's right. Um, and it was direct. This one is directed by Leonard Nimoy, which not his directorial debut, I think. I didn't look that up, but I think um, Three Men and a Little Lady were were his direct was his directorial debut. Yeah, but, and but, and that was basically to keep him involved in Star Trek because he had been mm -hmm. iffy about involvement to where they originally didn't have him in the first draft of Star Trek: The Motion Picture. Right, and then he was right, kind of right. willing to do that, and then he thought it was fun enough. Well, I'll come back for Wrath of Khan, but only if you kill me off. Mm -hmm. And then they wrote a back door for how to bring him back, but to make sure he came back, they said, "We'll let you direct." Exactly, uh, mm -hmm. which is what they did to uh, Shatner, and that was a disaster, uh, which we'll oh. talk about later. <laughs> actually, there's there's a actually there's uh, the reason that Shatner got to direct was because he and Nimoy had a clause in their contracts that was mutual self beneficial to where if Paramount gave any one of them a benefit, they had to give the same benefit to the other. So since they let Nimoy direct, now they had to let Shatner direct. <laughs> oh, the, the lawyers did it to us. It was the lawyers. They're always yeah. responsible. <clears throat> so now this one, Harv Bennett started writing the script within days of the release of Wrath of Khan. He had his idea for how he wanted this one to go right off the bat. Hmm. It, now, an early draft of the script was leaked to fans. It got out. And this is mm -hmm. in the pre-internet days. Meaning oh. it had to be rewritten from the ground up, which delayed release. They had to redo everything to to the point where it was delayed release from Christmas 1983 to June 84, hmm. uh, yeah. which, you know, thanks, jerks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember waiting as a kid, waiting for this movie to come out. Uh, so I'm kind of down on that strategy of if it gets leaked, rewrite. I'm like, yeah. if you've got the story you want to tell, tell that story. Right. Don't exactly. mess don't mess with it just because some other people learn it. The you know, okay, yeah, a few people will be spoiled. What else is new in the world? Yeah. Well, it's fascinating. This is a bit of a tangent, but uh, and we got a lot to get through, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. Yeah. But it's fascinating to me how studios react to fan pressure differently today than they did in the old days. Mm -hmm. Today, we're going to get a, apparently a Pike Enterprise series from CBS All Access here's because hoping. the fans demanded it. Yeah, yeah here's yeah. hoping. It, it's looking good. Um, and you know, Disney's doing the same thing with Star Wars, you know, with Obi Wan, the Obi Wan Kenobi series. But you know, back in the day, it was fans would demand it, and that might mean that they get that they wouldn't get it. Well, but it, but it is interesting though, if you think about it, looking back, this is only three years before Next Generation came out, 
So these three movies generated enough buzz for them to actually start the process to then bring Star Trek back to TV through Next Generation. Right. It was 87 is when Next Generation came out. So there was a response to the fan pressure of we want more Star Trek. Great. We're going to create a whole new series. (laughs) That's true. That is true. Uh, so uh, the other thing I want to say is that Leonard Nimoy, in addition to directing, he's apparently an uncredited writer co-writer. of the script. Co-writer. Yes, that's what the word. Mm. Uh, so it's interesting. He had a lot to do with, and you can kind of tell, as we'll go through it, uh, kind of tell where his influence comes in uh, in some of the ways that Spock is imagined in this uh, and the Vulcan culture. Yeah. Um, one, one interesting note, thing to note from the very beginning Khan is not mentioned once. I know. I was I was waiting, rewatching it. It's like, okay, how yeah. much information are they giving us about the events leading up to this? Right. And we know that there was this disaster with the ship and Spock saved it and all that, but we don't know what caused the disaster. They never talk about Khan in this. They they just talk about having that the Enterprise was repaired from battle damage. And right. As far yeah, never, as not even a mention of the name. Like, they didn't even have to show Mercado Montalban because they would have had to pay him, I suppose. Yeah. But they just not even a mention, which is an interesting. I, I, I'm not sure what the reasoning for that was. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't find anything online that explained it. Uh, so it was, it's just, it's fascinating that we just, nope, we're done with this movie that was really popular, uh, and we're moving on from essentially a couple of weeks or months after yeah. probably a couple weeks. of weeks at most yeah weeks. at most yeah. Um, i i was intrigued by the way the movie starts uh because yes. it starts you know since it is a immediate sequel to events that we've just seen but we saw those years ago when the when star trek 2 was in the theaters how are they going to remind the audience of it and the way they do it is a th- something that's common in tv shows now you know and and other media previously on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. And right. they give you a little recap. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so what they do is they start with a very small little rectangle on the screen showing us a recap of scenes from... In black yeah, and white. Originally in black and white. It's kind of blue tinted in the version I saw. Yeah. Um, yeah. And But it's not full color and it's small against a black background of shots from the end of Wrath of Khan, where Spock dies and so forth. And as we watch that recap, it gradually grows bigger, displacing the black background to fill the whole screen and coming into full color. And that symbolizes visually the reawakening of the audience's memories from a couple of years ago. And it was also presented as kind of like a uh, captain's report to Starfleet, like it's being watched on a screen and then transitioning into, yeah, could be. I felt like it was it was really a transition, like sort of the saying how it reminding us of like a TV show and expanding into like a movie yeah. too. I think that I thought that was maybe part of it. So maybe a combination of those things or, yeah. or one of them. One of the things I thought was interesting also is that we start with Spock mm-hmm. doing the, the final over. frontier message, yeah, right, which is the first time we had anyone other than Kirk doing that voiceover. I mean, we're yo- used to it now. But for fans going into the theater to hear Leonard Nimoy saying Space the Final Frontier, after having mourned the death of Spock two years previously, mm-hmm. now we're like, wow, Spock's back. We're excited. We're happy. Um, we hear his voice. I, I, if I remember right, too, doesn't Wrath of Khan end with yeah. Shatner saying the Space Final Frontier? So it end the one right. one one episode or one movie ended with it. The next movie started with it. Right. And this one, we also get to hear his voice watching a picture of a really beautiful 1980s space painting of the Genesis planet because this is pre CGI, so it has to be mm-hmm. a painting. Right. Yep. Right. Exactly. One of the other things about this opening, I just you know, I, I kind of some interesting things. Uh, there, there is when they're showing the names on the screen. They, you know, in the opening credits, this is back in the day when they showed the actors' names on the screen mm-hmm. at the beginning of the movie. There is a an extra long gap in the time between Shatner's name and DeForest Kelly's name, where Leonard Nimoy's name would have been. In fact, they white out the screen as they fly through the clouds of the mm. Genesis planet. Uh, so it's you know before the letters were white on a, a dark background, so now it's white on white, so you can't see it. So. His name is there, but it's not there, is, is what we're supposed to think. Yeah. <laughs> They're being coy about the fact, yes, Leonard Nimoy is in this movie as an actor. Yep. Yes. And uh, there's uh, the, and one of the other lines that they're short to tell us is the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one 
I have been and always shall be your friend. Those are the lines that we hear from Wrath of Khan, mm-hmm. and those are going to be the operative lines that really frame this story. Yeah, they're the bookends. Yes. So the Enterprise, as we mentioned, it's patched up. Cadet crew has been taken off. They're uh, headed home. They pull into space dock, and we get a cameo of, of with no lines of Janice Rand mm-hmm. watching her former ship all beat up after this battle with temporary hull plating all over it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, she frowns as she sees the damage on it. Uh, I I don't want to skip over one important line though. That's uh, from with, between Scotty and Kirk. There's a great moment uh, where Kirk calls Scotty on multiplying his uh, repair estimates by a factor of four to keep his mm-hmm. reputation as a miracle worker. Yeah. You know, yeah. That that line is a, a lot of fans love that one. Um, we also get right now the the first appearance of the Klingons uh, that are going to be in this. It's also the first appearance of a Klingon bird of prey. Right. Uh, because it, it was, in the early drafts, it was supposed to be a Romulan. Yeah. Show. Um, and we should mention the we get the first appearance of these Klingons. Obviously, we saw the new Klingon makeup as early as Star Trek, the motion picture. But right. here yeah. we meet uh, a pair of Klingons in particular because we meet these human information smugglers that have this very tall, statuesque, and beautiful Klingon woman with them named Valkyris, who they're working for, right. obviously evokes the word Valkyrie. Mm-hmm. And she is transmitting data to her lover, Krug, played by Christopher Lloyd. And so we have the two spaceships together. They transmit over the information. Krug sees part of it and is impressed. Valkyris admits having seen it, at yeah. which point um, the humans are going, so when do we get paid? And Valkyris is like, in a minute. And yeah. because she's admitted that she, in Klingon that she saw it, yeah. Krug says, unfortunate in Klingon, and then he kills her. And these have to be right. the dumbest information smugglers ever to be, <laughs> to be conducting yeah. a covert deal with Klingons, and you don't even turn on the universal translator? Yeah. <laughs> right. Or have someone who speaks Klingon. <laughs> right. I, I had a question. Was this Christopher Lloyd's first dramatic role? After playing Reverend Jim in Taxi, I seem to recall like being how how uh, different it was because the only thing I'd ever seen him in was Taxi mm-hmm. as this comic character. Who I mean, Christopher Lloyd is an amazing comic actor, but he's also an amazing actor in general. Uh, so it, it, it's just how different this character was. Uh, but he he inhabits Krug. He's great as Krug. Yeah. I, I don't know if it was his next role immediately after Reverend Jim, but it's certainly yeah. his most memorable one. I think after Reverend Jim and before Doc Brown in the Back mm-hmm. to the yes. Future series, which was 1985, the year after this. Apparently, uh, Lloyd doesn't do Star Trek stuff. Doesn't go to conventions. No. Doesn't really. He treats it just as a, it was just another job. He's not really into mm. it. That's well, I wonder too though is, if uh, interesting. he even realizes that he's more well known for Back to the Future than he is for this, because he does do some Back to the Future type things once in a while. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But not yeah. Star Trek per se. But it, you know, it, again, he was by, he was under costume. I mean, it wasn't until well after the Back to the Future movies came out that I realized that this was Christopher Lloyd in the first place. So right. Well, there's another actor who's going to show up in a second, right? Who also is somewhat well known as a comic sitcom actor. John yep. Larroquette plays Maltz, the uh, Klingon, which I, like I he I had seen Night Court, I think, by this point. Uh, where oh, yeah. he's on it, and he doesn't look at all like he no. does yeah. on Night Court, so it's pretty awesome. He, you can tell Christopher Lloyd by the voice and part of the shape of the face, but yeah. John LaRoquette, there's just, unless you know that's him, there's no way you're going to spot it. Exactly. I mean, maybe his wife would or something. <laughs> yeah. but, by the way, Christopher Lloyd was on uh, Buckaroo Banzai before Star Trek Yes, oh. yeah, he was. Yeah. Now, of course, it depends right. on when the two came out. I mean, which was recorded first. And yeah. I but think still. Buckaroo Banzai came out first. That's how it's listed on IMDb, but yeah. Yeah. Laugh away you can, a monkey yeah. boy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. Yeah. Also, he was and he was. Oh, I'm blanking on the name of of the big bad in that. The actor who played him. It's, oh, yeah. uh, The same yeah, yeah, actor yeah. who played Dick on Third Rock from the Sun. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, um, Lithgow. John Lithgow. John Lithgow. John Lithgow. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So many great actors in that. Um, so speaking of first, so the first time we've seen a Klingon bird of prey. But also, when we mentioned space dock, it's the first time we see this space dock, which we'll see again and again in next gen, and apparently it mm-hmm. lasts for several hundred years at some, at some point. <laughs> um, 
And we also see the Excelsior for the first time, it's, yep. uh, mm-hmm. which we will a bottle we will see again and again in the future Star Trek. So this this movie gave us many enduring images and designs that that they have lived on in Star Trek. So we, we I don't want to uh, overlook I, that. I thought it also gave us our first glimpse of a Targ because Krug has this oh, yeah. pet mm-hmm. on his bridge. It's his version of Porthos. Yes. And but it's actually not a Targ in this we Targs are more porcine. They're more like boars and this is not. It's yeah. described in the script as the Klingon monster dog. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe well, that's what it translates out. Oh. So. <laughs> uh, I do like Scotty's response to seeing the Excelsior. You know, the oh, she's trans warp. She's she's the new hottie, and he's like the yeah. great experiment. Yes, yeah. and he says, and if my grandmother had wheels, she'd be a wagon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Love. And Scotty gets some great lines. There's a lot of really good one-liners in this movie. They really have mm-hmm. an effective job or do an effective job of using comedy one-liners to lighten the mood in this. Yes. Oh, absolutely. It could be a dark movie, yeah. They're dealing with very serious themes, and that's what you need when you're dealing with very serious themes. If it's not going to be depressing, is you need some way to relieve the tension periodically and let the audience have a moment of happiness, and, and the little comic one-liners do that. Especially since they, they show Kirk mourning through much of the first, these opening scenes where he's in his right. room and he's mourning yeah, spot. Right. It could be very depressing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so you know they they find McCoy uh, has four. Well, they first they have an alert that somebody has broken into Spock's quarters that had been sealed. And Kirk's has a line. He says, "This crew is on the verge of obsessive behavior re- regarding Spock." And I'm wondering what else has happened. Uh, maybe something that's on the cutting room floor. Yeah, they don't show us anything. It really comes across as like the lady is protesting a little too much here. Yeah, I was, was going to say that sounds. I, I was. I always took it as projection on Kirk's part. Okay, that he recognizes okay. it with himself. But he goes down to uh, to um, Spock's quarters, and the security guards are apparently moops ball players from the Legion of Superheroes, <laughs> judging by their costumes. <laughs> well, they finally have armor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, what an sort idea! Sort of padded armor, and the, and the, and then they let their captain go into the darkened room with the forced open door first, first ahead of them. Yes. Well, they've and learned then, red shirts get shot. Yeah, yeah. They're the ones with the phasers. Yeah. Well, and then we have this figure in the dark who speaks in. It's Leonard Nimoy who does the line. I mean, I I, yeah. I, 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 got, I I knew from the first time I heard it that it was Nimoy, but I gather some fans didn't know. Well, they there are get it. there are there are a couple of spots where DeForest Kelly did use the Nimoy cadence. Okay, there are a couple of spots in here, but it, it's one of those where he's like off screen and you hear him, or, or he's on screen and he's doing it. Because when it's off yeah. screen, it's always Leonard Nimoy. But when right. he's on screen, there's a couple of times where he does use that same cadence and he kind of goes a little deeper in his voice to sound a little bit like Nimoy. Okay. And but when it is Leonard Nimoy's voice is when it's when you can't see him clearly. So it's Correct. off screen. And the purpose of that is to cr- generate cognitive dissonance. Like is Spock back? Right. Yeah. Cuz we just heard Leonard Nimoy's voice and but no he can't be. Right. And fans are it's the search for Spock. Fans are waiting for him to show up, you know, walking around the corner at every point, you know. Mm-hmm. Aren't you dead as we saw in Rathacon, you know. Yeah. So the the big thing here is is, is Kirk and the crew want to repair this Enterprise and take her back to Genesis. And they're told, nope, the Enterprise is being retired, and Genesis, a for- Genesis is a forbidden subject. You are under NDA. You may not talk about it. And I'm wondering, why does Kirk want to go back to the Genesis planet? So, what, is the- what do they hope to find there? I-, I know. Apparently, I think they want to retrieve Spock's body, but then mm-hmm. they didn't even know that it had crashed onto the Genesis planet, because we it, later, right. David... Is is surprised by that, and it's like, oh, gravitational fields were in flux. Yeah. So I, it, why he wants to go back to Genesis isn't really apparent. I understand. Let's repair the ship and go back out on a mission, but I don't know why to go there. I wonder if that was kind of out of out of sync because, of course, later on they have a good reason to go back to Genesis Planet, but they didn't at that moment. And if there's something in the right. writing that was out of sync, right? Yeah, I'm I'm uncertain if they have a good reason to go back to Genesis as Enterprise. Um. But we can figure that out as we go. In uh, in Spock's quarters, I mean, you may well be right. I may just be misremembering. Um, but in Spock's quarters, McCoy is like weirded out and saying, you got to go to Mount Salea. Yeah. And and Kirk is, but Bones, Mount Salea is on Vulcan. And then we later learn the significance of that. Um, 
but not for a little bit just yet. Right. He does say, remember, in Spock's voice there. Yeah. You know, so there's the, he wants to go home. We're home. We're on the Earth. And like, no, no, we have to go to Vulcan. So uh, w- then we find out that Savick, now being played by Ro- uh, Robin Curtis uh, and and Mar- uh, David uh, Marcus, are there. Uh, they had stayed behind on a science vessel called the Grith- Grissom to check out the, the Genesis planet. Yep. I, I want to take a moment to talk about this change of actresses. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. What happened? Why? Why? Where's Kirstie Alley? Where'd she go? Apparently, she was replaced as as best as I could figure out due to bureaucratic bungling and bad negotiating. Oh. Paramount failed to put an option clause in her Wrath of Khan contract for a sequel, and then when negotiating for the next movie, her manager apparently, and this is disputed, but apparently asked for an outrageous amount, which was rejected without a counter offer and they just went and got Robin Curtis. Mm-hmm. That's best as I could find. And out. that's Sounds... unfortunate because as much as I like Robin Curtis and as much as she does okay in this role, she's not as good as Kirstie Alley. Kirstie mm, Alley right. had this icy coldness that yeah. Robin Curtis doesn't. Right. Exactly. In fact, there was I think at some point uh, and in fact it's in the novelization, uh this there was going to be this attempt to create a relationship between Savick and Mark David Marcus. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. It, which it never got onto the screen, but I think the actors thought it was going to. Mm-hmm. And so they were building uh, chemistry that wasn't there. And so, yeah, she wasn't as detached as, 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 yeah. As Kirstie she, Alley do, she doesn't come across as, as, as Vulcan as Kirstie Alley does. Yeah. Incidentally, um, if I read the novelization of this when it came out and one of the things in that it's, it, or, or other material that I read at the time suggested that Savik is meant to be half Vulcan, half Romulan, which is yes. an interesting idea, but it also never made it on screen. And apparently right. it was deliberately not put on screen and a decision was made to have her just be a total Vulcan. Mm. Yeah, that's kind of interesting because they do make it so that she at times it doesn't have full control like most Vulcans do. So I'm kind of curious, like, again, like the actresses in both cases were both um, a little bit trying to play to that and didn't and and no one told them that they weren't going to do that so <laughs> i find that interesting uh so savick and, and david markets on the grissom they scan the planet they find spock's torpedo tube and indications that there's life there and they say well there's not supposed to be any animal life on this planet how can a planet exist a planet with plants without any kind of animal life what pollinates the plants well earth did i mean plants doesn't mean flowers mm-hmm. pollinators are needed by many yeah. species, but you can't have plants without pollen. Okay. So it's possible that – was it true that in, like, uh, previous eras, like the, the, the pre-dinosaur eras – Yeah, there, were, there weren't there flowers Most then. plants were not – there were no flowers. Okay. So there were – all right. So you could have a, a planet full of plant life with no animal life. That's right. yeah. logically what possible. What you can't have is just plant life without microorganisms. You're going to need microorganisms to keep the biosphere functioning properly. And that's mm. essentially what okay. they end up finding. By the way, I just want to mention, if Genesis reshapes matter, why were gravitational fields in flux? I, I don't, I don't right. get that. It's not going to change the planet's mass. It's not going to change no. its shape right. in a big way. Apparently um, it did some so, or something or... Yeah, Star Trek. I think I think it's just <laughs> bad science writing. But um but you the creatures they find on the coffin are like hyper evolved versions <clears throat> of microbes. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that were on the coffin or on Spock or something. They they, um, they said on the, the, coffin, on the yeah. torpedo tube itself or the t- torpedo uh casing itself. Yeah. What what they look mm-hmm. like though is is giant uh pasta shells like, like you should just yeah. pour some so- <laughs> yes. pizza sauce over those and eat them you mean they weren't <laughs> or, already and, it, mm. and, and, and if you don't then they're going to keep evolving and try to eat you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. they become gah uh, so uh so so Savick clearly thinks that this life form that's on the surface is could be spock and so she really wants to go down the captain of the grissom is the 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 most cowardly bureaucrat <laughs> I mean, this this guy will not step out of his shower without getting permission <laughs> yeah. from Starfleet. This Command. guy is one of two captains we have in this movie who is deliberately effete. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, he's yes. this guy, and not is not as effete as the other guy, but he is more cowardly. 
And right. that tells yeah. us both of the we're, we're not supposed to like these captains. They're they're not Kirk. They're not this brash, determined man right, figure right. that Kirk is. Well, right. and, and to be fair, this this is obviously a mission that's being watched very, very closely by Starfleet because it's already a big controversy just between the previous it, movie and this one. Yeah. So Right. So <clears throat> we cut to Kirk's apartment. We see his apartment again, which we saw in Rathacon. Uh, and they're having a sort of memorial party. The bridge crew is having a memorial party for Spock. If I recall, they toast absent friends, which is a traditional Navy mm -hmm. toast for the fallen. Yes. Yes, it is. And uh, they then they get a knock at the door. It's Sarek, Mark Lennard, showing up first time on screen, apart from the animated show Yesteryear, yep. but his first time on screen since Journey to Babel Yay. in the original yep. series. Uh, Mark Lennard, one of the two best Vulcans ever to play in in Star Trek that it, him and Leonard Nimoy I mean Mark Leonard is perfect yep. as a, as a Vulcan and he, and this time it's personal he wants a Katra <laughs> yep <laughs> it's right i've come for your Katra <laughs> Sarek is upset that Kirk didn't bring Spock's Katra or Vulcan's you know his the Vulcan word for soul to Vulcan Spock's essence his living spirit and so Sarek had assumed that that Spock would have given it to Kirk before he died, and so he mind melds with Kirk, and we get <clears throat> these really creepy close-ups of of Mark Leonard's lips yeah. and, and William Shatner's eye, uh, and then he realizes that he didn't get Spock's Katra. And the re the reason he says that because we saw you know Kirk on one side of the glass and Spock on the other side of the glass in the reaction chamber, right. and as Spock was dying, and he said Kirk says we were separated, he couldn't touch me. And so that's the explanation for why he couldn't pass the Katra mm -hmm. telepathically to Kirk, except in there are episodes of um, original series where Spock mind melds with someone who's on the other side of a like a stone wall, and he can't even mm. see the guy. Right. Maybe mind meld is different from the Katra pass? Or... <laughs> maybe, or, or maybe this is a radiation shielding glass that is impenetrable to telepathy or something. Could but be. Could be. No. You don't want accidental <laughs> telepathy in the, in the reaction chamber. Uh, yeah. So uh, they, go, they go look at the tape, and it turns out, yep, that's, he gave it to, to McCoy. And so Sarek wants him to bring both of them to Mount Salea on Vulcan. Which apparently they need the body, like because at this point no yeah, nobody realizes no. that Spock's body is alive. Right. They 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 and this is all messed up because I, I assume when he says bring both of them to Vulcan, he means McCoy and the Katra. Yeah. And the plan right. is they're going to take it out of McCoy and put it in whatever they do with Katras, which we later learn is that in Enterprise in the series Star Trek Enterprise is they have Katra arcs. Yeah. So they're like Katra mm. storage facilities for those who have passed on. And this is part of the so uh, there doesn't seem to be a need for them to go to Genesis from what from my read on this. They certainly don't need the body. I mean, there've got to be all kinds of cases in Vulcan history where someone passed on their Katra and then their body was lost, you right. know, mm -hmm. vaporized or buried or in some way made inaccessible. So I can't see how they need his body for that or if it's if they just want it ceremonially for to bury it on Vulcan, they should have said that. Right, right, yeah. It's they they don't they don't connect the dots on that. Uh, I have to say the Katra arcs they must be the ultimate cloud storage. That's what I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So well, uh, it's like it's like death in heaven on Doctor Who. Exactly. It's like yeah. So uh, you know, back on Genesis, we get this brief uh, moment oh. where David and Savik find the torpedo and the microbes that have evolved, and then they have an earthquake and they hear screaming. Yeah. Also, though, before we leave the scene with where Sarek wants the Katra, you know, he says, bring him to Mount Salea on Vulcan. And Kirk is like, what you ask is difficult. And I'm going, <laughs> really? Why? That's like saying I need a couple of tickets to Bangkok. Well, I, you yeah. know, I mean, he can get a ticket for himself and a ticket for McCoy to Vulcan. There got to be commercial liners going there all the time. No <laughs> problem. That's why I think right here, the the, the implication is supposed to be not just the Katra, but the body too. Right. I think for some mm -hmm. reason, Sarek is saying you must bring the body to Vulcan. Well, then since they're not planning on reuniting them at this point, then yeah. um, they I, I it creates a new problem because 
any Vulcan as smart as Sarek is going to recognize it's not logical to ask someone to go to a forbidden, highly <laughs> controversial interstellar flashpoint planet that's top secret right. and to retrieve a body. Right. Well, yeah. I, Sarek's logic, does he later on says where his son is concerned, his logic has sometimes uh, failed him. <laughs> so mm. maybe this is another yeah. case where that has happened. So Kirk has to go try to first he got to convince uh, Morrow, who is the Starfleet commander, to let him go. And there's this whole conversation about whether he le- believes in Vulcan mysticism. But if there's the slightest chance, he owes it to Spock as if it were his own soul. And Morrow says, um, you can't take Enterprise because it wouldn't take the pounding. And I'm saying, what pounding? They're going to oh, fly yeah. it out, yeah. grab the thing and go, like grab the body and go. Like, it- it's like they're anticipating. This, this, in the script, they're anticipating stuff that is not yet known mm-hmm. to the mm-hmm. to, to the characters yeah. or the audience, uh, and that that's problematic. And, and this is one of the reasons why I think that uh, this is not as good of a, mu- a movie as you know the even numbered ones. It's not as good yeah. as two right. or four or six. Yes, and and partly that may be because they rewrote this thing because the original version leaked, and the yeah. new patched up rewritten story may have had these quirky logic problems introduced that the original might not have had. Yeah, I think that's that's true. But we do get another one of those great comic lines where Sulu and, and McC- uh, Chekhov are hanging out in the lobby of the restaurant waiting for Kirk after he talks tomorrow. And they say, is what the word, sir? And Kirk says, the word is no. I'm therefore going anyway. <laughs> and, then, yep. and, and they uh, they go. And so uh, now, uh, meanwhile, McCoy, who's all, you know, messed up by the Katra in his head, he he goes to the Moss Eisley Cantina across with the Regal Beagle from yes. Three's Company. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it is it is so obviously modeled after it's a nod to Star Wars, not as it yeah. just another canteen alien cantina scene. But um we have uh we have uh, him negotiating the with price a of a ship with yeah. a smuggler. Yeah. And the smuggler talks like Yoda, I hear am new. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. and and he even points to it and says, "Look, my backwards friend," and yeah. tr- then tries to neck pinch him like Spock. Right. Uh. Well, he tries to neck pinch the Federation security agent. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Who yeah. interrupts? Who's sitting right next to him. Yeah. Yeah. Who's yeah. like? I I don't think you want to be talking about this uh, right now, D- uh, Doctor McCoy. And he and McCoy keeps coming up with these like Vulcanisms, like sort yeah. of the way Spock right. would talk. Um. And for, so, for for example, when he first comes in, the waitress asks him to name his poison, and he says, "It is not logical to ask someone to purchase poison in a place in a of bar. refreshment or something <laughs> yeah, like that." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to your planet, welcome. I think that's my line, stranger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, McCoy gets locked up. Kirk shows up at the at the jail, and uh, he mm-hmm. goes to visit him. He's uh, he's Looney Bins. I need to go see him before you take him away. And he walks into the cell and he goes, how many fingers am I holding up? Fruity as a nutcake yes. is what he says. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then he, uh, he does the Vulcan's uh, hand sign and says, how many fingers am I holding up? And uh, it's, McCoy's like, it's not very damn funny. And he says, your sense of humor yep. has returned. The hell it has. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, yep. I love he, that exchange. He, he also, um, when he's told he's got Spock's Katra in his head, yep. um, he says, it's his revenge for all the arguments he lost. <laughs> Yeah. I love yeah. how, in McCoy's perspective, Spock lost all those arguments. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I mean, the the best part of this movie are these interactions between the people, the characters we love. That's the best part. Oh, of yeah. It. The and, plot of it isn't as good as the as that. And that's what was missing from Star Trek: The Motion Picture was all the right. character interaction, and yeah, the exactly. actors knew that immediately. This is a problem. We're not relating to each other like we normally do. And so with Star Trek II forward, we have lots more character interaction. Yes. Right. Also, we have this scene where they bust McCoy out of security prison is similar to the Death Star escape sequence. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I was going to say, that's another one where it was very clearly uh, a nod homage. to Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> because you, you, Including where he's blasting the panel. It, you know? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, Just like Han Solo shoots a panel, Sulu shoots a panel and with this really cool wand looking thing that's not a phaser yep. and causes it to all you know spark and blow up also he's initially when he comes in with kirk he stays in the outer office and there's a yep. security guard seated at a at a console and he and the security guards 
security guard's just kind of kicking back. He's kind of laying down in his chair and stuff. And uh, Sulu tries to talk to him. And the guy, for some reason, takes offense and stands up. And it turns out he's mountainously tall. Yes. And yeah. he looks down at, at Sulu and refers to him as tiny. Yeah, and, don't get smart, tiny. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's like, whoa, 23rd century sizeism. And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, Except and, Sulu has, gets his own. <laughs> yeah. He flips him, d- flips him with judo and then says, don't call me tiny. I love that. Yeah. That's one of my favorite things. <laughs> and then the uh, the operative line for you know the the operation is in in progress is the Kobayashi Maru has set sail for the promised land. Yeah, nice yeah. scriptural reference there. Also, we get another li- nice line uh, as we cut over to the Excelsior, where J- uh, Scotty has become has been promoted to captain of engineering yes. on this mm-hmm. great experimental ship, who he, that he's totally unimpressed with. And he gets in an elevator to join the others in the rescue mission. And Leonard Nimoy voices the elevator. Yes, he does. Mm-hmm. And asks him where he wants to go. And the and he and he says, up your shaft. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He says, level, please. Transporter room. Thank you. Up your shaft. Which <laughs> I wonder what happens if you say that to Echo. Uh, I don't want to try it right now while I'm sitting here. No. <laughs> Alexa, up your shaft. <laughs> She says she's not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as well, she should not be. Uh, yep. th- th- well, and I, I love the, the the promised land reference because we're dealing with a, a reference to the afterlife here, in a sense. You know, the, there mm-hmm. is this this religious meaning to here, and I want to mm-hmm. get more into that as we get to that part of the movie. Yeah. But there is this religious meaning to where they're trying to bring Spock to the promised land, to yep. to eternal happiness, and. You know, we we take a left turn and or basically a U turn at the end, but there's it's it's very interesting. So I I don't want to miss mm-hmm. that as we go through this. Yeah. Oh, also one thing we haven't really fully made clear is not only are they not allowed to take Enterprise, but Enterprise is going to be decommissioned. Yes. And they yes. Uh, the ad, the admiral uh, says it's going to be it's twenty years old. It's actually more than that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But they're going to just there's going to be no more Enterprise, which is going to you gonna know scrap it, make fans sad. Scrap her. That ups the drama. Yes, yes. Uh, and it gets even worse later. So uh, they show up at a, a remote duty station, a transporter room. Uhura, who could get any duty station she wants, takes his backwater transporter room, where she's stuck with this you know, green ensign who dreams of adventure. And uh, in, in fact, the, when Kirk and the others come in to use it without orders or any type of protocol being observed, he's it's damned irregular, he says. And yeah. she's like, uh, she calls him Mr. Adventure, and she points her face at him and says, get in the closet. And she's yeah, like, of course, the transfer room's got a closet. Yeah, of course, of course. And uh, it, oh, what does she say? She, I, she, I, I missed he, the line. He says something about this, isn't, this can't be real. And she says, this isn't reality. This is fancy. Yes. And, yeah. and yeah. That's you want an adventure? Actually... How's this? The old adrenaline going? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the, this isn't reality. This is fantasy is actually a reference, although I'm blanking on exactly to what at the moment. Um, but they're playing uh, off music. another line in, that was in the pop culture at the time. Right, right. Uh, um, Bohemian Rhapsody, probably. Oh, yeah, I think so. No. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Is this real? I don't is, think is this just there. fantasy? This... Mm, could be. Yeah. This, that's a line in Bohemian Rhapsody, but I don't yeah. know if, yeah. it's, if they're making that. All, all, now, I thought when I saw this in the, se- in the theaters back in yep. 1984, they missed a huge opportunity with Mr. Adventure. Okay. I thought, because unfortunately, so Uhura beams the rest of the gang up to the Enterprise, and she then says, I'll meet you at the rendezvous point, which is so she's going to go to Vulcan. And that takes yes. her out of the almost all the rest of the movie, which right. I thought was a shame. I thought what should have happened to deal with the Mr. Adventure problem is Uhura should have gone with them on the rest of the adventure and forced Mr. Adventure to go along with them and have his own adventure. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been that would have been great. Been I mean, fun. it would have been mean to put the guy in a court martial offense, but you know they they made him. Uh, yeah, but yeah, I, I would have even I would have even tried to arrange it so he becomes a regular member of the Star Trek cast from now on, like Robin Curtis did as Savic. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's funny. true. That would have been good. That would have been good. I noticed there is a sign in the transport room. By the way, I love that. Yeah, again. I love the sign. The caution sign. 
<laughs> yeah, no smoking. No smoking. Place your feet in center of pad and keep extremities within transporter field. <laughs> yeah. Like keep your hands and feet inside the car, folks. I guess <laughs> yeah. smoke could be a little hard to transport since it's fine particulate matter. But really, the you know yeah. those Heisenberg compensators should be able to do it. Well, what it tells us is that smoking comes back in the future. <laughs> yes, exactly. Is there any doubt? I mean, once you can cure cancer, yeah. who cares? Yeah, exactly. Right. Yep. Also, something that comes back in the future is ridiculous 17th century pink little blue boy suits, because that's what Chekhov is wearing. It is a terrible... It's like the costume <laughs> yeah. from the famous painting Blue Boy, except it's pink. And he's got he's, <laughs> he's got this ridiculously huge collar. I can only imagine what Walter Koenig's reaction must have been when they tried to costume him this way. Well, you, right. Well, you got to love the the the, uh, the leather right. uh, cope uh jacket that Sulu was wearing too where it wasn't like an actual jacket yeah well it's still better than the little pink blue boy suit <laughs> and i i noticed uh if you watch carefully halfway through the movie the ridiculous collar Chekhov is wearing vanishes mm. ah. so i assume there was some costume rethinking midway through the filming <laughs> I, I i'm trying to find the the okay the credits uh styles Captain Styles. Yeah, Captain Styles of the Excelsior yeah. is played by the so was actor. uh James Sicking. James V. Who, Sicking, yes. Who had been in a number of shows. So he would have been known a, a known actor to the audiences at the time. Well he was um, he was in Hill Street Blues right. at this time. Mm -hmm. But right. then he was also Doogie Hauser's dad. That's right. And and he plays our second ridiculously <laughs> effete Starfleet captain. Yes. Not only uh, he's not cowardly, but he's got this weird techno riding crop. It's a swagger he strides stick. around. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and he's he we see him filing his nails in bed. <laughs> right. And he's ridiculously like overconfident, like arrogant. Uh Yeah. And so there's a, the the Enterprise is being stolen by the the Enterprise crew and the Excelsior, there's a yellow alert. He's like, how could you have a yellow alert in space dock, dock uh, to the bridge? I'm like, I can think of a bunch of different reasons. <sighs> Aliens, terrorists, yeah. accidents. Explosive decompression. Yeah, there's yeah. all kinds of reasons you can have a yellow alert in space dock. Like, what an idiot. Uh, uh, and then, so the Enterprise is slowly making its way out uh, toward the doors to the space dock uh, hangar. And Kirk's like, and... <laughs> the slowest one quarter impulse power ever <laughs> yes. impulse power full impulse power is supposed to be the speed of light so this should be something like a quarter the speed of light i mean you would rip through the space well, doors at I that wonder, speed so it's mm. power not in speed uh, there's a long fan debate about yeah impulse power versus speed but uh that, it's ridiculously slow it is looking. it is slow it is, it is maneuvering thrust is really not impulse power but uh, right. um there's a kind of point where where kirk is kind of anticipating this moment and he says and now, Mr. Scott, and the doors, Mr. Scott, he's like, hi, sir, I'm working on it. It's yeah. like, <laughs> are we going to get the doors open? He thought the doors were going to open for him. Um, they barely do. Yeah. Now, Kirk, uh, Styles warns Kirk, you know, this. if you do this, Kirk, you'll never sit in the center chair again. And as fans, we know this was the most important thing to Kirk. Like this was uh, the, the thing in Wrath of Khan he, yeah. and in the motion picture. He wanted to get back in that chair. Mm -hmm. Uh, but here, there's not even a hint of hesitation on Kirk. He does not care. His only concern is Spock, his friend. And it's a it's a shift in this character that's at this moment. Right. He says he just says warp speed, and yes. they warp out of there. And he's deliberately throwing his career away yeah, to help exactly. Spock. Also, just another visual note. I thought the interior of the space dock, and to some extent the exterior, but especially the interior looked like the Death Star and the the interior of the Cloud City of Bespin, where you have Luke falling down the big tunnel. Yeah. Um, I thought there was more visual design crossover with Star Wars. Yeah. Here. It had a very much uh, sort of an imperial aesthetic to it, it at least. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Also, then, so now that Kirk has warped out, uh, the Excelsior is like, okay, we're going to totally catch him now. We're going to pass him uh, and catch him coming back. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so they, they fire up the transwarp drive. And then we hear a sound that many of our listeners who were born in recent decades <laughs> may not be familiar with. An <laughs> engine stalling? It's the, 
It's <laughs> it's the sound of a car engine failing to turn over. Yeah. Yes, stalling. <laughs> and yeah. That grinding. I mean, we all had to deal with that growing up when yeah. you're driving your first clunker car. Yep. And it's it might not just, in good repair. And that, it, rrr, 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 it just rrr, might rrr, just rrr. start like it's going to catch and then nothing. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. And then another reference many of our younger listeners may not be familiar with. The uh, computer console on the Excelsior says, good morning, Captain. Yeah, right. And that's a reference to Captain Kangaroo, a famous children's <laughs> show of our, of, right. of our childhoods. Good morning, Captain. That's right. I missed that. Uh, and, and then uh, Scotty on the Enterprise turns to Dr. McCoy and says, would you like a souvenir, uh, uh, Dr. Eddie? From one, some, from one surgeon uh, to another. Yeah, a couple of yeah. handful, a handful of little parts. It's little the micro more Tran- transwarp spark plugs or something. Yeah. The more complicated to make the plumbing. Well, he, he they... said it was. He, he said it was something in the computer. Yeah. So he didn't actually do anything to the warp right. drive. It the, was the computer the that controls tr- it. That transwarp computer up. Core, yeah. Yeah. The more complicated you make the plumbing, the easier it is to stop it up. So, <laughs> which was good. Now back on Genesis Planet, Savick and David uh, find a young naked Spock in a snowstorm. He's he's now a child at this point. He's rapidly growing along with the planet we find out um they tell captain esteban on the grissom and he's timid and by the book and refuses to beam them aboard without instructions from starfleet but you know krug which is good for savik and david and spock at this point because krug decloaks and blasts them yeah and he also i think the reason he cites if i remember correctly is decontamination protocol Mm -hmm. right it could be a problematic and but it's like guys transporter filters are supposed to take care of that Right, right. Uh, I mean, yeah. otherwise, that's going to be on every single planet you visit. You have to have a functional decontamination system of some kind already in place. Well, yeah, Kirk would have beamed him up. <laughs> Let's just put it yeah, there, exactly. clearly. So meanwhile, uh, we got Kirk and, 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 and those guys back on the Enterprise heading to Genesis, and he asks for a scan, and then we hear Spock's voice uh, mm-hmm. scanning now, Captain, and they turn, and it's McCoy. He's like, did I do it right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah, and you're creeping us out. Exactly. <laughs> So, by by the yeah. way, another plot problem is so Krug shows up and blows up the ship, yes. and he's come here to find the secret of Genesis. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, that's not going to be something you can say in a sentence. That's going to involve technical files and lots of technical knowledge. Right. And Krug is entirely well. So actually, Krug doesn't try to blow up the ship. He wants to disable it. He says shoot its engines. Yes. Mm-hmm. But his weapons officer makes a mistake, has a quote lucky shot. <laughs> it's <laughs> then unlucky for the weapons officer because he gets vaporized by Krug for yeah, right. for what he did. Um, but notice how cavalier Krug is gonna be in upcoming scenes with killing people who would know the secret to Genesis potentially. Yeah. Right. Well, the one person who knows the most is the about one Genesis. who gets killed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> Not very smart. Not very smart. Uh, so, but back on the planet, Savick confronts David about the craziness of the planet and the weird stuff going on and the anomalies. And he reveals, uh, you know, a MacGuffin here that he used proto matter in the Genesis device, which is apparently unethical and creates unpredictable uh, results. Uh, he was taking a short, a scientific shortcut. And that is what happened here. And and it's it's sort of a it's a sort of a cheat. They need the planet to age rapidly and to become a dangerous place yeah. and to destroy itself. Actually, scientific shortcuts are quite common. Right. Especially after the develop the nuclear bomb was developed using a new technique that's now called Monte Carlo science, where instead of rigorously proving something, you just kind of try and approximate. <laughs> Yeah. And and hopefully it works out. Throw it all together and roll the wheel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Go all in and spin. But th- in this case, it's this is an approximation or this is a, a shortcut that has been deemed unethical by every reputable scientist in the galaxy. Right. Uh, although if you if you uh, go later on into the, the next generation series like DS9, it shows up quite a bit. Proto matter so, does. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then in the expanse, it's a real problem. So, <laughs> mm. yeah, but that's another show. <laughs> so Krug uh, stops. The, Krug beams down to hunt down David and Savick and Spock um, with his couple of henchmen, and stops at the torpedo tube to kill one of the evolved microbes with his bare hands. Because you which, know, which are now big snake, snaky monsters. Yes, we have uh, sunset on Genesis, which happens really quickly. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. But about the uh, about the him while well, he kills the evolved microbe. I yes. mean, it's like wrapped around him, and he chokes it with his with his hand and is like his fingers are digging into its flesh and it's bleeding some weird color yep. blood. 
And he's meanwhile talking on the communicator to the Klingon ship, and he gets a comedic one lighter. Nothing happening here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, you, so Spock is rapidly aging in love with the planet. They have days, maybe hours, is what the what the uh, Savick says. And, and the uh, and, and the reason he's aging the way he is is he's doing it in surges because yes. the planet is aging in surges and they're linked together. And right. so every time the planet undergoes a surge, Spock undergoes a surge. Right. Um. So they spot the Klingons approaching from a distance, and they see them in the. Uh, their light, their flashlights or whatever in the forest below them. So instead of Savick, a trained Starfleet officer going to confront them, David, an untrained scientist, goes instead because of yeah. chivalry or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, and while he's gone, Spock undergoes pun far, and Savick does what? She does the nasty the with him. Well, it's implied, maybe. Oh no, it's or totally maybe... real. That's totally what happens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> she tells David. And it's understandable he wouldn't know this because in a muck time, they established Vulcans right. don't like talking about this with outsiders. Um, yes. That every seven years of their adult life, Vulcan males have this uncontrollable urge to mate. And if they don't, they'll die mm-hmm. and under ordinary circumstances. And so he, Spock, is getting old enough. Now, he looks like a teenager at this point. Right. And this actually causes a problem for a muck time because in that episode, Spock has apparently not mated before with his wife to Pring. They're only legally married. Right. And but he's clearly way older than a teenager. So up to this point you could have said, well, maybe Vulcan males don't have aren't considered adults until they're 30 or something. And right. so this would have been his first mating with Tpring. But in this movie it's establishing you're you're uh, you're a late teenager, you're an adult mm. and you have Ponfar. So Spock would have had to have mated before we saw in a muck time, and but he didn't. So this is causing continuity issues. In a muck time, he does say that he has used Vulcan disciplines to put it off, the, to wait. I thought so, that meant like weeks or something. But, uh, but I think it meant. I, I thought it meant like it, in the last couple of cycles. So every seven years, he's put it off the last couple of cycles. So mm. I mean, otherwise, Vulcans would be f- dry, you know, flying back to their planet every so often. To, well, that's what they st- imply in a month yeah, time. Is I guess, that this yeah. is just uncontrollable, and you will die. I, you- I I think your head cannon works, but I think it's contrary <laughs> to the intention of the of um, of I the guess. authors of a month time. Well, it's, I don't know. I I never. It didn't seem like headkin. It seemed like that's mm-hmm. what they were saying. But maybe maybe that's mm-hmm. maybe I have to go look at it again. Um, I wonder what Tuvok did or was going to do. Well, they covered that. I mean, he he had a wife and children at the time Voyager left, mm-hmm. and then they did an episode that yep. dealt with Ponfar. Okay, that's right. That's right. That's been yeah. a long time since I watched that. Yes, but anyway, I yeah. there's another problem here, which is that I think it's really problematic from an artistic perspective to do this in this movie. Um, I think it would have been better to handle it another way or say he just surged past that Mm -hmm. or something rather than having, because we get what's basically a Vulcan foreplay scene. Right. And and and, uh, just like Leonard Nimoy had established the Vulcans are a very tactile culture and and Sarek and, and Amanda, when they showed up, had this affectionate thing where they would each take two fingers of, on, yes. on the hand and put them together um, as kind of their That's version of PDA. holding hands. Yeah. And so they take that element from the past and turn it into a form of foreplay. And right. I'm going, we don't need to see this. This is and, this right. is too much. Well, at least, you know, it's not like some movies today where they would show a lot more than foreplay. But they anyways, would sh- they, right. today they would, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that, yeah, like Discovery or something would would, go, would totally do that. But it's interesting in that, I think there was clearly an intention in Wrath of Khan, not in the on screen, but in some of the stuff I read, that originally Savick was going to be a romantic interest for Spock. And yeah. then they backed off of that as well. But yeah, then they bring it back here, but then Savick and Mark and uh, David were going to... So it's a very it's kind of confused. And uh, yeah, I agree. I, I, in 1984, I wished they hadn't done it because it just... It's Spock. I don't want to see yeah. that. You <laughs> know I don't want to see that for Spock. That's Spock's <laughs> business. It is not mine. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so moving on from that, the Enterprise finally gets to the, the Genesis planet and they encounter the bird of prey. They fire on each other. The Enterprise is disabled and Kirk's going to bluff his way because 
clearly the Enterprise at her best would out- outmatch the Klingon bird of prey. Mm-hmm. That's, they they say that here, uh, but because the Enterprise is running under automation that Scotty, uh, Scotty has rigged up, it's disabled quickly at, at, under battle conditions, and they're they're pretty much uh, sitting duck. So Krug lets the um, he lets the away team Savick and, and and David talk to Kirk. Savick tells Kirk in a coded message that Spock's alive. Marcus says, Genesis is a failure. Don't bother. You know, there's no, th- I can't believe they'd kill us to get it. Right. Which he doesn't what a Klingons naive very well. person. I mean, yeah. the Klingons immediately fixate on the idea of Genesis as a weapon. Exactly. And, and it's still a weapon, even if the planet falls apart. It's still a planet killer. Right. Yeah. I was yes. going to say, yeah, it's you, you launch Star. something like this on an inhabited <laughs> planet, like, say, Earth, that could be a bad thing. Right. Yes. Yeah, exactly. One Genesis device can totally apocalypse your whole planet. Exactly. <laughs> right. So Krug says, okay, we've got to kill one of them to prove a point. I think when we to the point before of like, why kill the guy who knows the most? I think Krug assumes that because Kirk is the one who gave the report on Genesis that he saw, right. that Kirk has the information he wants on Enterprise. Exactly. That, and he says, kill one of them. David is the one who precipitates his own death. Right. He jumps yep. the the guard. The guard was going to kill Savik, and David mm-hmm. redeems himself by leaping to defend her and getting himself killed. Um, right. But Krug's attitude still didn't make any sense. Um, right. A, a, an admiral is not going to be a scientific genius, typically. And so you've got a scientist, and you've got a military officer. You shouldn't be saying, kill one of them, I don't care which. Right. You right. should That's care. True. You should say, kill the, kill the boy. Kill, you just know the Vulcan's a scientist. You know David's yeah. a scientist. So kill the security kill. officer woman or whatever she is. Or kill the boy. <laughs> you know, right. So Kirk, at this point, because David is his son, it falls apart. You know, you cling mm-hmm. a bastard, you kill my son, he says. He, well, he stumbles. His first reaction is he's silent and he stumbles backwards and falls off his chair. Right. As he tries to sit down, and apparently, if I recall correctly, that was not scripted. That was an accident that occurred on the set, and it totally worked. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. And then it was very effective mm-hmm. emotion. So if some people say, "Oh, Kirk only just got you know realized he had a son. Uh, why is why is he so upset?" But when we got to remember, in Wrath of Khan, he he actually says to Carol, "Is that David? Hmm. He knew about David." Yep. He just had been stayed away, so he knew he had a son. Even so, I mean, if I, after all these years, magically, and this is impossible, <laughs> given my life history, <laughs> right. um, my wife and I never had children, and there isn't, without yes. going into it further, <laughs> yeah, right. um, <laughs> I, I have no son. But if I did, that would immediately be a Copernican revolution of my personal emotional oh, world, yeah. and right. I would totally fall apart if that its son then was killed exactly especially given what just happened to his best friend yeah right. spock so he's had a lot of emotional shock. and the fact that him and david had reunited had had repaired their relationship right in the previous events yeah right it, they just had this this the opportunity that maybe from now on will be for, uh, family and, and even if that wasn't there and even if spock wasn't dead yeah i'm never going to be able to reconcile with this guy i'm never going to be able to bond with him it mm-hmm. would be devastating right. no matter what exactly. if you're if you yes. are an emotionally sensitive person yes exactly uh so christopher lloyd here plays Krug. i think he plays a great yes. he's ruthless yep. he is a ruthless klingon calculating calm I mean, I really like Krug as a Klingon uh, bad guy. He's also an, a more intelligent Klingon than some of the stereotypical Klingons that are just like, it's a good day to die, so I will kill you. Yes. Yeah. He he has style. Yes. What I like is he's uh, him as a villain is not just that he's ruthless or anything like that. It, I like the fact he's magnanimous. Mm-hmm. He's a sympathetic right. villain because... When he he offers Kirk a deal of like, you know, you have, we'll surrender, just give us a minute. Krug says, I give two minutes for you and your gallant crew. Yeah. And it's like, right. yeah, that's like supervillains with style. <laughs> well, like Khan, did not Khan, didn't Khan give him two minutes? Uh, remember in, uh, in Wrath of Khan, he gave him two minutes to yeah. hand over Genesis as well. I mean, it's kind of, what we're having is this parallel moment. It's like, Kirk must be sitting there going, 
Have we not done this before? <laughs> <laughs> so Krug thinks that the Enterprise is full of uh, Starfleet officers. Right. So he sends his entire crew over to take All the ones that aren't on the planet. Mm-hmm. Right. Kirk has decided to sacrifice the Enterprise, and they start to self-destruct, which is, by the way, the same self-destruct codes that we got in the original series. It was exactly the same, just different officers mm. giving the codes this time. Check off at Scotty this time. Uh, and they beam out on the transporter as the Klingons are beaming in, which is a really neat yep. trick. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, and they, uh, the Klingons uh, go to the bridge, and the, the, it's empty, sir. Only just this voice. Uh, w- let me hear it. Yeah. <laughs> The computer is the only thing that is speaking, and then My he hears boy. it and realizes it's a countdown. Yep. Get out of there! So, I have to say here, that the destruction of the Enterprise, for me, this is the first of mm-hmm. too many times uh. that the Enterprise gets destroyed in the movies. Let's just say that. They went back to this well mm-hmm. once too many yeah. times. Yeah. The first time, as a Star Trek, a young Star Trek fan, was devastating to me in, in some ways. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That, that was, that's kind of what, was, what I wrote down. is like, when this one happened... Fans were absolutely shocked and devastated because the idea that this ship that was as much a character yeah. yes. as the crew was all of a sudden gone. Yeah. And this would be like permanently losing the TARDIS permanently right. on yeah. Doctor Who. And it, it's and it, 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 interesting to then compare, what, four movies, five movies later with Generations where it was just like, oh, we got to get rid of the Enterprise D, so we're just going to poof, it's gone. <laughs> right. <laughs> One more yeah. time. It, it, was, it wasn't like this where... In this scene, the Enterprise went up to take out, you know, basically sacrifice itself, if you will, to take out the Klingons. It saved it saved Spock yeah. and Kirk and the rest by yes. sacrificing itself. Um, in, in in generations, it was, we need a new ship. Let's blow it away. With J.J. Abrams, it's like, ah, we're bored with this one. Let's get rid of it and get a new one. Yeah. Yeah. The This was not a change. Right. So with the like the J.J. Abrams one, it's so you can have a new model to sell. Yep. Right. Um, it's just a change for visual style reasons. This was not that. They had changed the Enterprise visual style with the refit yep. that it had previously had. Yeah. Um, and But still, fans knew this is the same ship we've been following all these years. Exactly. This was the first time we'd ever seen our ship that's had all of our beloved characters on it, and now it's blown up. It's gone. It's That's never happened before in Star Trek history. And it's it's incredibly emotionally effective for mm-hmm. fans of this era. This is a criticism, or is linked to a criticism I have of this movie. In Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan, we got some new things. We got the Genesis device, which is this amazing perspective technology of hope. And then we got David Marcus yep. and, right. and, and Carol Marcus. Well, this movie undoes all of that. Carol Marcus is nowhere to be seen. David dies, and it turns out he was a fraudulent scientist who, who you know, mm-hmm. ruined the Genesis project by using protomatter and taking a shortcut. And so Genesis doesn't work. David is a dead scoundrel, and BB's nowhere. BB Besh, uh, Kara Marcus, is nowhere to be seen. This movie reverses the advances that were made in Wrath of Khan, but destroying the Enterprise was a good move. It was genuinely emotionally effective. Mm-hmm. Right. So emotionally effective that in the recent animated series from a few years ago, Scooby Doo Mystery Incorporated, <laughs> which is the best version of Scooby Doo that's ever been done, you should wow. totally watch it. It's a two season story arc. Okay. One one story arc, two seasons. Wow. Um, when we get to the climax of the story arc, Fred sacrifices the mystery machine and <laughs> and Fred turns to Daphne and says, Daphne, what have I done? And Daphne says, what you had to do, what you always do, turn death into a fighting chance to live. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. This is directly lifted from Star Trek. You know, and and then they get a new mystery machine by the end of the series, just like we eventually get a new Enterprise. But we didn't know that was going to happen here mm-hmm. because it had never yes. happened before. We'd never seen a ship replaced. Right. And all of this emotion was almost ruined by the Paramount Marketing Department, which put the destruction of the Enterprise in the TV commercials. Yeah. Like, what are you thinking? Like, yeah. They, this, is, this would be like putting Spock's death in Wrath of Khan in the, in, the, in the TV commercials. It's like. That was it was ridiculous. It was such a bad move. Uh, but this was this. I mean, 
I again, agree. This is this is this is before the internet, so a lot of the a lot of the spoilers, like everything now, is spoilers and teasers, and right. You didn't have that back then, right? You didn't have spoilers like you do like you do now. So to be spoiled on something was a big deal. Um, so they rescue Savick and Spock on the planet from the the Klingons who were guarding them uh, because they beamed down. They have to get off the planet, so Kirk calls Krug and taunts him. Krug and Kirk fight over the lava. Kirk wins when he gets the high ground. He yells at Krug, I've got the high ground. Give up. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) And then Krug falls into the lava yelling, precious. Uh, (laughs) Those are echoes of the future via uh, tachyonic telephone. Exactly. Yes, exactly. exactly. So uh, he gets the communicator. He, uh, Kirk remembers what, uh, what, what uh, Krug said to Maltz, uh, Maltz, Jo Ku or Jo Kui. No, Maltz Cho E Chu. Cho E Chu. That's right. That's clearly on for Which beaming means up Scotty. Maltz yeah. activate beam. Yes. Uh, so they get up there. Kirk says to Maltz, they get the drop on him. Help us or die. I do not deserve to live. Fine. I'll kill you later. And then later on, he says, you said you would kill me. I lied. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just love that exchange. So and then uh, Spock and McCoy, uh, you know, a brainless, you know, a um, uh, cultureless Spock and McCoy have a moment alone where McCoy um, tell Spock he misses him. And of course, the brainless Spock happens to be the exact same age he was when he died. Yes, when he died. Yes. Lucky Luckily coincidence. Yes. And they got <laughs> happened to get him off the Genesis planet at the exact age that he, the actor, was in the previous movie. Yep. And luckily, severing the connection with Genesis, because Genesis blows up. Yes. I mean, it do- totally does a does a Krypton on us. Yes. Um, it, that didn't simultaneously kill Spock. So getting him off the planet apparently severed his link with the planet. Must have. Without killing him. Yeah, it's a distance thing. But he's unconscious. So they arrive on Vulcan. There's a lot of steps to the top of Mount Slea, let me yeah. just say. Yeah. <laughs> There's no elevator, apparently. And when they get there, they have this Vulcan, like, open-air temple. And if you look carefully at the decorations, there's a stylized Vulcan hand symbol that they yes. have. It's so it's you have to think about it, but yeah, that's a Vulcan hand symbol. Nice. You know, there's a, so I wanted to say here, like Nimoy insisted against the uh, the what the the studio wanted. He insisted that the movie has to end with the ceremony and the return of Spock. The 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 suits wanted them to have like Spock just to kind of show up, uh, come around the corner, like, hey, I'm back. Uh, <laughs> But they, it was, but Nimoy insisted on this ceremony, and if you look at it, there's a lot of the Jewish temple oh, rites, yeah. Jewish mm-hmm. feel to it, because Nimoy himself was, a, as we say, an observant Jew, and uh, including the Vulcan hand symbol was actually a blessing, blessing symbol. Uh, hand yeah. symbol. Yeah, from uh, yeah. synagogue services. Yes. Uh, and so there's this very strong feel, of a very religious feel to it. Sarek requests the Fal Tor Pan ceremony, which is uh, a reuniting of the Katra and the body. Um, there's a lot of resurrection imagery we mm-hmm. get, uh, we, but we also have this Jewish imagery, like the jeweled breastplates that, that uh, Sarek and some mm-hmm. of the others are wearing, which reminds of the temple priests. The high priest in the Old Testament wore a yep. jeweled breastplate. Right. McCoy identifies himself as McCoy, Leonard H., son of David. Yeah, mm-hmm. that was nice. Son of David it was interesting that Jesus is the son yeah. of David, the son yep. of you know the son of God, the son but, of David. By the way, notice the Jewish style patronymics, where it's you're so and so, son of so and so, like David Ben Gurion yes. or Simon Barjona. Right, exactly. And I I just thought there was th- this imagery like it when I remember I remember when I first saw this, the ceremony seemed to take a long time. <laughs> it actually doesn't take very long at all, no. but it's very ethereal and mystical, and the music is sort of anticipatory and it it kind of makes you sit on the edge of your seat a little bit and it swells slowly mm-hmm. to that climactic point. You know, one thing that it's kind of struck me too is again, if this was filmed today, you know they would have some ethereal effect, special effect like a cloud coming out of McCoy and settling on Spock. Right. And I think it was actually right. more effective by not having that. Right. Yes, the, less is more. The Vulcan priestess woman just touches both of their foreheads yep. to serve as a telepathic mind meld bridge. Right. Also, they use dialogue to, you know, amp the seriousness of all of this and the kind of eerie quality to it, because the Vulcan uh, priestess woman has this kind of, you know, elevated, stilted dialogue that signifies this is special. Yes. And um, she also says that what uh, Sarek has requested hasn't been attempted 
since ages past, and then only in legend. Right. And she says, the danger to thyself is as grave as the danger to Spock. You must make the choice. And McCoy says, I choose the danger. And then in a side, he says, hell of a time to ask. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what am I supposed to say? Do, do you have a consent form? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. And then at the end uh, of the ceremony at sunrise, which is mm -hmm. very evocative imagery, the sunrise. Resurrection. Uh, on yeah. Easter, Jesus rose. And, and speaking of that, we had resurrection imagery as early as when they found Spock's coffin, and it had his burial robe in it. It's like yes. the up. Shroud of Turin of Star Trek. Yeah. Right. Right. It, it's John, you know, the John and Peter showing up at the tomb that's empty. Right. Uh, there's a lot. I mean, it's interesting to see how much resurrection, Christian resurrection imagery is throughout this movie mm -hmm. uh, to, to kind of to hint, to hint at that. Uh, so we have this sunrise, uh, the gong sounds, Sarek, the priestess McCoy come out. Um, and then, uh, you know, what about Spock? Kirk asks Sarek, and only time will answer. Which is nice because that, that draws it out. Instead yep. of he's yes. just fine, like, oh, Spock walks around a corner like the suits wanted. Spock's yeah. over there. He's in the ceremonial robe. He's not talking. He's turned away. Only time will tell if he's going to be mm -hmm. okay. And we'll get another movie to get. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know. Because Spock is now in post-regeneration madness. There you go. <laughs> just <laughs> subdued he is a Vulcan post-regeneration madness. But it's going to stick with him all the way through Star Trek IV. Yep. <laughs> That's right. So uh, Sarah calculates the cost of Kirk, his ship, his son, his career. And uh, Kirk says, if I hadn't tried, the cost would have been my soul. Mm. And it's a really, it, it's a maturation of, of Kirk, I think. Mm -hmm. he's, he's no longer so self-absorbed about his career and getting old and, oh, you know, blah, 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 of uh, the motion picture in Wrath of Khan. Now it's, I just, I'm doing this because it's the right thing for my friend. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's a nice moment for Kirk. Yeah, we've had crises force out what Kirk cares about most before. And what he's always cared about most before has been like being a captain Yep. Or having the Enterprise, right. and now he realizes what's really important is the people. Yes, yes. And then he says the needs of the one outweighed the needs of the many. So, you know, the, the, sometimes logic dictates that the many sacrifice for the one and not the other way around. Um, and then Spock, we, we do get that moment of hope at the end where Spock remembers, you know, Jim, your name is Jim. You saved the ship. You, you know, Kirk says, you saved us all. Oh, no, he says, the ship out of danger is what he says, because yeah. that's what he what he said at the end of Wrath of Khan. And he says, Jim, your name is Jim. And that we get that moment of hope. And then on screen, the ad and the adventure continues dun, dun, dun. and they all gather around and pat him on the back. Yeah. Yep. So uh, so uh, final final notes, final words about uh, just a Spock? couple quick things. Um, no, we've mentioned this before on Secrets of Star Trek, but the. Model of the Grissom came back in Next Generation, the episode Naked mm -hmm. Now, that yes. Sikorsky, um, they, was this, they just reused the model and destroyed it again. Uh, apparently, they didn't have enough fun destroying it the first time. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the Vulcan priestess was Dame Judith Anderson. Now, she's, she's one of those classic actresses who show up a lot. But those who are familiar yes. with the, the, uh, the great Ten Commandments, uh, the, the, the 1950s version, uh, she was the nurse servant Memnet. Oh, right. She's, right. she's the one yes. that, I that, knew, uh, that before. knew that uh, Moses was a Hebrew and presented the, the, the scrap of the, of the uh, blanket that he was wrapped in to, to Pharaoh and where Pharaoh, that led Pharaoh to go after the Israelites and all that. Right. And right. They, they later made that blanket into a, into a costume because it was the only thing that was as invulnerable as Moses. Yeah. <laughs> you you do know so, yeah. Moses, Superman is based in part on Moses, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh yes. 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 Somebody had some criticism of the of the red lipstick that the priestess had on, which um, since red lipstick is based on the red blood of mm. of mm. human women, but whereas Vulcan women would have copper based blood, it would be green, and therefore red lipstick would not be appropriate. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. It was kind of funny. I was reading it. I'm like. That's, That's a, a very stretch. interesting, uh, really all, all, detailed. Also, the hot blonde Vulcan priestess, junior priestesses, are a little distracting <laughs> in the ceremony. I'm just saying. <laughs> yes, I'm, gl I'm glad we don't have that in the Catholic Church. The diaphanous robes, uh, that would be uh, very distracting at Mass. So we're glad we don't have that. <laughs> Jimmy, anything, uh, any other notes? Just a few small notes. Um, I liked on the Genesis planet, which as it's going through these crazy climatic changes, um, you know, each section of the planet is a different climate and they're all getting jumbled together as it ages. Mm -hmm. And we get this neat 
the snowstorm where they find Spock is actually in a desert. Right. And so we get these yep. nice shots of snow on cacti, which you yeah. can actually see sometimes in northern Arizona. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, that's, that's, that's another one of those scenes where those of us who are from northern climes looked at it and went, yeah, that's just paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not really snow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In the final confrontation with Krug on the Genesis planet, um, it's become a lava planet, essentially, at this point, with rocks, right. fire. And you know, we have a tree that bursts into flame and rocks are shooting up out of the ground. And we see this big volcanic lava sea background. And that makes it very much like hell. Mm -hmm. And so we have this genesis apocalypse yeah. thing happening mm. before us visually on screen and it, um because as scripture tells us the world would be destroyed the second time by fire and that's what we see here also i thought this was the best of the less good movies yes this is better than than five or Certainly. or one i thought that one of my big problems ever since i saw it in theaters is where is spot getting all this body mass mm. Even yes. if you've got, even if he's got this <laughs> mystical link with the planet that ages him, he should be like a, a, a he should not be growing in this way. Right. He should be f stuffing his face every single second of this movie with food yeah. to drive his metabolic processes and gain body mass. It, right. it, 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 and even that really wouldn't work. But he's just getting body mass out of nowhere, which makes no sense. Gravitational fields are in flux. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Mass quantities yes. are in flux. It's effect of the proto matter. Yeah. yeah. Yes, well, yes, yes. it's a lot of hand wavium. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I thought in the final scene where Spock is just remembering, starting to remember things, he, he he's got the whole Enterprise crew there and Kirk. And he's walking past all of them, but he focuses way too much on Kirk. Yes, I know Kirk is his best friend and not the others, but I thought artistically the f in singular focus he has on Kirk is too much. They, the filmmakers would have mm. done better to have him display more recognition of, the other, of his other crewmates that he served alongside for years. Because even if, he, even if he's not BFFs with them the way he is Kirk, He's still friends with them. Mm -hmm. Right. And it comes across as a little tasteless to focus so much on Kirk at the expense of the others, especially McCoy, because you know right. he's got a special relationship with McCoy, too. Yeah. Lastly, I thought it was interesting when the, and somewhat implausible, when they're on the Klingon Bird of Prey, when the Enterprise crew gets control of the Klingon Bird of Prey, and they're trying to figure out the Klingon GUI, the graphical user interface for the Bird of Prey. <laughs> yes. yep. And they're debating what different controls do. And all I can think is Sulu must play a lot of Klingon Bird of Prey flight simulator on his spare time <laughs> to be able to pilot this yeah. thing. Yeah. Where, where's the inducer? This? No, this. That or nothing. Boop. Yeah. <laughs> there they go. Well, but you see, we see that a lot in Star Trek, though, where they're looking at an unfamiliar ship, an unfamiliar display, and now they figure it out. We, we talked about quick, it recently you know? with Trip went to the alien uh, yep. uh, ship in Enterprise. So, yeah. Yep. You know, I, I want to mention quickly uh, the 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 blo the planet destroying itself like a vision of hell. I mean, that's in a way that's it reminds us of the descent into hell. Like, so Jesus, after you know, you know, on Holy Saturday, that's traditionally held that. He he mm -hmm. descended into the dead and before the you know, resurrection. Raised the dead from... Yeah, so I mean, yep. he passes through Spock passes through hell on his way to the resurrection. In a sense, you could say exactly. By by the way, by Jimmy, you mentioned about you know recognizing the crew. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that have been a funny scene if if he would have looked at McCoy? You are McCoy, very illogical. Yeah, and then something turned. like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would have been great. That would have been great. <laughs> uh, or I won all those arguments. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, I do want to have we got some feedback I want to uh, go over quickly. But I know this is a long episode when we talk about the movies it goes long, uh, but I do want to get some of this really good feedback. Uh, we had some from Julia uh, via email uh, on our episode we discussed uh, the Voyager episode Phage uh, episode sixty two. She says, "Love the show. I hate to be that person." No, Julia, it's okay. Uh, I hate to be that person. We're that person in some of these yeah. episodes. So, but that's actually, fine. an iron lung wouldn't have helped Neelix's predicament. He remember he yeah. they put him in this special thing to mm -hmm. breathe for him. The iron lung works to fill the lungs by manually expanding the chest when the diaphragm can't. Without lungs, it wouldn't work, mm -hmm. of course. The more, the more analogous technology would be ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, a heart-lung bypass machine. I have a feeling Julia mm -hmm. works in uh, medicine I'm guessing, somewhere. yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. 
Yeah, these do not have a limit to how long they can keep a person alive, as they don't oxygenate the blood as efficiently as natural organs. However, your larger point still stands. Oh, these do, do have a limit, she said, to how long they can keep. Yeah. Um, however, yep. the larger point still stands. Even with current technology, we can keep someone alive days to weeks on ECMO. So hundreds of years in the future, they should be able to do it at least as well. Maybe the technology was lost in the same event that destroyed all knowledge of seatbelts. <laughs> keep up the good work. Going to, and then she says, uh, going to sign up as a patron as soon as I finish this email. Thank you, Julia. We yes, really thank appreciate you. it. We, we really do. appreciate it yes. and need it. Yes, thank you. Uh, and uh, we love your, your feedback. Very good. Uh, we lo I love the little uh, nitpicky details, so d don't worry about uh, that. That's great. Oh, yeah, no. But corrections are great. Yes. Oh, absolutely. As long as they're right. <laughs> <laughs> then on episode 61, the one where I wasn't here for comparing Deep Space Nine and Babylon 5, which, by the way, guys, people love that one. Got a lot of good feedback on that. Oh, cool. Oh, we, we enjoyed doing uh, it. And Spaceport uh, comments on YouTube. It says, DS9 is at such odds with previous Star Trek, while Babylon 5 is its own thing. Both suffer the budgetary curse of mostly humanoid aliens with characterizations that always feel like exaggerated humans, and the politics is oh so human. Mm. Both are dystopian with very unbelievable victories by the good guys, so they don't appear too grim. But I respect Babylon 5 for its writing, performances, and world building. It creates a depressing but likely true depiction of first mm. contact in our future. DS9, however, just destroys the Star Trek legacy, dystopian, religious-based, and with a CIA-like Starfleet enforcers in Section 31, making the Federation an ideological front. I loathe it. Well, mm. I, I'm going to have to disagree. I, I, I don't know that it de destroys the Star Trek legacy, but what do you guys think? Well, I think all three of us are on record as mm -hmm. being fans of DS9, um, right. and I think it rounds out and expands the Star Trek universe and actually, in a way, returns it to form. Right. Because the original series was never as utopian mm -hmm. as uh, as Next Gen became, yeah, and so I th and we and and also both the original series and Next Gen by focusing on the best crew in Starfleet, right, is an unrealistic picture of the rest of Starfleet and the rest of the galaxy. Right. I mean, there were planets that were really scraping colonies and stuff mm -hmm. in the original series, and DS Nine, we're looking at a. a, a a planet that's just been through a traumatic war. Right. Exactly. And and so and also the original series was never as secular as mm -hmm. Next Gen. So this is again a return to form where it's okay to talk about religion. Personally, I I like it, but you know the saying, de gustupus non est disputandum. Right. right. There is right. to be no disputing about tastes. Exactly. Yeah. And you know it's it, it I think it's always been a complaint at least throughout the the especially the TNG era of you see, like you said, Jimmy, like the best of the best. Well, what about the other ships? What about the other crews? What about the other places? You know, that's always been, you know, and right. of course now it's interesting as we're talking about this, they're working on lower decks, you know, a cartoon, which that's basically the principle of this isn't the best crew of the best ship. This is like the lower decks of like the nobody ship, the ship nobody wants to be on. And these are like the low got, lowest guys on the totem pole is what they're doing with this series. So it's actually like the exact opposite of that. The Orville was supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be a, a, an homage to Star Trek uh, yeah. about a ship that was not the best ship, the flagship. It's sort of the, the it's 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 not even among the best ships. It's it's just the middle of the road basic ship. You know, it wasn't the Except biggest they ship. Lost it wasn't, that. The, it wasn't yeah. the biggest ship. It wasn't the most powerful right. ship. It was just a ship on the work with day ships. But I feel like they lost that, and it and it became the focus. And suddenly now they are the best ship. Yeah. I mean, the way the the most recent season ended. With them having to be at the forefront of all of the, the exactly you know, the the, mm. the victories and things like that, uh, which is so it's another show. But uh, uh, your point stands though uh, about about DS Nine compared to Next Gen. Thank you both for your feedback. We love to get feedback, so uh, we, we yeah. really do appreciate Absolutely. it. Even disagreement, because you know, <laughs> like I said, there's to be no disputing about taste, yeah. but that doesn't mean we can't well, talk about it. And we want yeah. we want to have discussion. I mean, we enjoy yes. that. So yes, yeah, discussion rather than dispute. Right. So before we sign off, I do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create The Secrets of Star Trek, including uh, Julia, we just heard from, but also James S., Kathy S., Aaron W., Brooke K., and Joel L. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue The Secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What did you think of Star Trek Three: The Search of Spock? Uh, where does it 
land in the pantheon of Star Trek movies for you in the in your listing of them, let us know by visiting sqpn.com slash trek or the SQPN Facebook page and leave us some feedback. Uh, you can also send us an email to trek at sqpn.com. And we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the Next Generation episode, I Borg, which is important if you are looking forward to seeing Star Trek Picard, the new series, because it's going to be relevant. Uh, I won't spoil it now, but... Uh, you think so? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Until then, Father Cory Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Dom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thank you, and live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, to expect one to order poison in a bar is not logical. <laughs>